So today I'm going to talk about the functional programming community and how we might be able to improve the way that we share the Lambda love. Or, in more technical terms, how we might be able to do some refactoring and rework to help make the community a bit more extensible. I know that refactoring, or change of any kind really, can be a bit of a slippery subject. But I think this is a really important topic, so please bear with me. I promise there will be cute animal pictures along the way. Although this might be a bit unconventional for a keynote, uh, I'd actually like to start by showing you some code. And I'm not actually going to do it using one of these, uh, the laptop or the puppy. I'm going to write it by hand. So I'm going to pen the code in T-line. Uh, it's pretty clear how it was derived, so I won't waste time explaining the syntax. We'll put that as a slug at the top for Miss Compiler and the name of the conference too, so Erlang User Conference. There you go. You all excited to be at the Erlang User Conference? Yes? <laughs> you look like a pretty smoking hot audience, if you don't mind me saying so. In fact, I'm actually a little bit worried this might be a bit too difficult for you. It has its roots in secretarial science and it is pretty hardcore. I know you'd usually use Erlang for this sort of thing, but let's face it, hardly anyone likes the syntax, so let's open our minds to a superior solution. So let's start with something you might be able to grasp. Uh, we want to figure out SRVRs, so we'll declare that. And to calculate them, we're going to call on the underscore Athenium and use that to percolate, or as I like to say, do a bit of a penomorphism. We're passing an assembly of points and a transformer, even though you code in Erlang, I'm sure you're familiar with those at least, that takes a point. And inside the transformer, we're going to figure out a live rating by calling on the next door transformer with a point and the assembly of points. And then just simply figuring out how long the result is. The next door transform, I'm, I've penned elsewhere, but I'm sure you can imagine it. I bet by now you're a little bit surprised by how elegant this is shaping up to be. It really is the only correct way to write code, especially when you're talking about speeds of 120 words a minute. If you're really good at English and maths and you work really hard, maybe you too one day will be able to do this. But, you know, or not. Just don't nag me with any questions. So next, we're going to simply perform the obvious exam to see if the rating is 2 or 3. And if so, simply return it and hail it as a bastion of truth. And that's it, IIF. So when you're trying this at home, you'll just need to set up one of these cameras and run the standard command. Oh, and hire a compiler, of course. So did anyone not get any of that? Put up your hand so we can all see. Look at you awkwardly. <laughs> So that was my coding demo. How many people feel confident they know what this code does? Does anyone want to hazard a guess? <laughs> no, not even that. Even if you figured it out, I think you'll agree that was a pretty terrible way of explaining it. And the purpose of that exercise was to try to help you cast your mind back to the time when you were an outsider to functional programming, the time before you knew what all the jargon meant. That time wasn't actually all that long ago for me, but even I still know that it's, it's quite easy to forget sometimes what it was like when you're on the other side of that experience. So let's do a bit of a retrospective. Sorry, post-Agile people. What worked well with that demo? Well, the code I showed actually does work, uh, but everything else was pretty terrible, I think. Uh, there was unexplained jargon. There was an assumption about your ability based on your appearance. There were insults based on the programming language that you like. Uh, you were primed to believe that what you were seeing was going to be hard and you weren't given the opportunity to ask questions, at least not without being made to feel a bit silly. You weren't given any resources for doing this in your own environment or anywhere to go for help. And you weren't given any context or, or motivation to want to understand what was being communicated. I could have told you I was writing a function to help implement Conway's Game of Life, which is a cel cellular automaton and explain that it's about cells or points that either live or die over a number of iterations based on the, a few rules around the state of neighbouring cells. 
could have shown you this Wikipedia page to motivate the example and show you how interesting the results could be. Could have also told you that the syntax, T-line, is a type of shorthand used by journalists, but I was actually using it to write JavaScript, because I'm a cruel and unusual person, I guess. <laughs> I could have broken this down for you to give you some idea of how it works. Uh, for example, I could have told you that uh, this symbol stands for Q, or the word equal, and the little circle means S. So together this means equals, and this is in the code here, 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 double equals, there, and there. Which might have given you a little bit more of a handle of what's going on. I could have built on some knowledge that you already have by telling you that uh, the T-line is based on handwritten letters, uh, by showing you the alphabet here, where you can kind of start to see that. And most significantly, I could have explained what I was saying in terms that would be familiar to you, rather than unfamiliar ones. I did none of this, and although this example was quite extreme in that almost nothing I did really helped serve the goal of helping you understand, I hope that it reminds you of some more subtle, but nonetheless of putting examples of things you've seen like this out in the real world, or the world, real FP world. If so, please keep those at the back of your mind. So I've titled this talk, Composing a Functional Community, for a few reasons. Notice I'm talking about a community, one. I hate to disappoint you, but I'm not actually talking about the Erlang community. I'm talking about the functional programming community more broadly. Some of us may embrace different languages, different syntaxes, different ways of working, but I think there is more to unite us than there is to divide us, and we should be working together. Erlang community, Elixir community, Clojure, Pascal, Scala, Regardless of the differences, we want to refactor the FP community as a whole. This community I'm talking about building is a functional one. Functional, of course, in that it embraces functional programming, but also one that works, one that operates well. And this functional community is something we want to compose. Composing is, of course, function composition and building up results from smaller puzzle pieces. You need all those different pieces to get the desired result. I also want to point out that composition is a deliberate act. It doesn't just happen without any thought. So the key idea of this talk, spoiler alert, sorry, is that all of us are responsible for sharing the land of love in an effective way to help compose a bigger, more diverse, functional programming community. And a few questions naturally flow from that, most notably why and how. Given most of us here are likely programmers, I've decided to delve into that by looking at the core topic a bit like it were a coding exercise. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background and then define the problem we're facing, discuss the structure of a possible solution, looking at the inputs, outputs and method, and then finally finish up with a brief chat about the often forgotten postlude testing. I'm truly honoured to have been given the opportunity uh, to speak to you here today. Given I've met very few of you in person before, I thought I might start by giving you a little bit of background about who I am. In the unlikely case that you can't pick my accent, I can confirm I'm from Australia, the land down under, uh, which seems to inspire a lot of interesting animal and insect memes like these ones. Uh, I promise I didn't bring any spiders or sharks or drop bears with me. And in defence of my nation, don't forget we have cute creatures in Australia too although those koalas actually do have some pretty nasty claws in them. So, I'm an Aussie, and the reason I was able to write the T-line shorthand you just saw a little bit of earlier is I am a former journalist. I worked in newspapers for a bit over seven years before switching over to the IT industry about three and a half years ago. I should probably admit up front that Erlang isn't my functional mother tongue, so to speak. I am actually literally wearing my programming language preference on my sleeve right at this moment, um, so you don't have to come up and stare at me awkwardly later. Here's a close-up. Uh, so when Haskell designer Philip Wadler saw me wearing this, he actually chastised me for not including a QR code linking to the source code. So I apologise, I did neglect to do that, but I can tell you that these are sorting algorithms written in Haskell. So I am a fan of Haskell, however, I have made a habit of participating in a variety of programming communities, FP-focused and otherwise. So I'm a pretty familiar face at a variety of meetups and other events for people who write Haskell, Scala, Clojure, Erlang, JavaScript, Ruby, Python and PHP, among others. My day job is working for Red Hat as a developer advocate for the open source OpenShift platform as a service, 
which requires me to deal with all kinds of different developers who are interested in using the platform. And if you're interested in that, feel free to talk to me uh, during the rest of the conference. I co-founded a group for women in FP called Lambda Ladies, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. And I'm a co-organiser of the Brisbane Functional Programming Group, which is a meetup group based in Brisbane, Australia, with more than 500 members now. We've really seen it start to take off in the past couple of years. And finally, as you may have gathered, I'm a woman. <laughs> this means I'm a member of an underrepresented group in the FP community and in the wider programming community. I heard it said once that every woman in tech will eventually do a talk of being a woman in tech, and I'm, I'm not a candidate to be a counterexample for that. I am going to share some of my personal experiences today. To be honest, I'd rather be talking about something more technical, both because this is a somewhat contentious area to address and because I wish there weren't any need to talk about it. I wish that there wasn't an issue. But there is, and I think it's an import, important enough topic uh, that we spend some time and effort focusing on it. So that's a bit about who I am and where I'm coming from, but I also want to make it clear uh, who and what I'm not. So I'm not someone who can speak for all Lambda ladies or all female programmers or all women. I'm just one person. Whether you like what I have to say or you don't, please don't assume that any of my ideas presented today are necessarily shared by uh, anyone in any group that, with which I happen to identify. This is something that those in underrepresented groups always have in the back of their minds, that if we make a mistake, it's going to underscore some negative stereotype and affect others from our group. Please don't fall into that trap. Finally, I want to make it clear, uh, just because I happen to be someone who is part of an underrepresented group in the FP community, uh, this doesn't make me an expert on diversity or community issues. I don't necessarily know all the relevant theory, and I certainly don't have all the answers. I'm not here today to offer the silver bullet for addressing community issues. I'm really just here to start a conversation. I have made an effort to crowdsource some of the content I'm presenting by talking to other people and by doing some research into relevant areas so that I can do my best to reflect more than just my own thoughts. But dealing with these issues that we have as a community is something that needs to be done you know, with healthy dialogue between many parties rather than any one, per one person's take on it. So with those preliminaries out of the way, let's move on. Just like with any technical issue, uh, we can't tackle a problem unless we first understand what it is. So let's bravely stare this issue in the face. I want to look at two problems, or two different facets of the community issue. The first is that our community is not as big as it could or should be. Functional programming is awesome. It has elegant solutions for dealing with today's computing environments and the need for concurrent distributed systems. I don't need to convince you of that. You know it, especially as users of Erlang and OTP. FP has all this goodness, and I think its popularity is on the rise because of it. But if we're honest, we'd have to admit it hasn't really hit the big time yet and become a dominant paradigm. This is reflected in many places, uh, but just to give one example, uh, I did a search recently on the Stack Overflow job site, which has almost 1,500 jobs listed, and of those, there were just 12 mentioning Erlang, or Haskell received 14 mentions, Clojure 8, and Scala a little bit higher with 53. And this was in contrast to Java with 532 mentions, Python with around 300, and C Ruby and C Sharp with around 250. Now, of course, FP isn't limited to particular languages, so that doesn't perfectly reflect uh, those positions that embrace FP. But I think it's still a pretty good indicator that there is work that can be done on this front. Why should we bother? Well, with a bigger FP community helping FP to become more mainstream, there would likely be more FP jobs. That is, more jobs that don't make us want to poke our eyes out. There'll be more chance of us getting to work with code that we like and there'll be more people to share the workload of creating awesome things with FP. More open source code, more libraries, perhaps even more languages. I would argue strongly that this is a very good thing. The second problem uh, in our community is that it's not as diverse as it should be. What does that mean? What is diversity? When you hear the word diversity in tech, uh, sometimes it's used in a way as if it's synonymous with gender diversity. That is one type of diversity, but it is only one. Diversity is about including people of all kinds and categories. Here are just a few of the groups that are included that, in that. Gender diversity is there, but I'd like to point out that it means more than just the lack of women. Gender diversity also encompasses people who are genderqueer, agender, non-gender conforming, and a fluid gender, among other things. 
The aspect of diversity I'm going to mainly focus on in this talk is the lack of women in our community, as it's the area I'm most qualified to speak about, but many points will apply as well to other types of diversity, and the conversation that we have around this as a community must be broader than that. If you want a good general primer on diversity, I recommend watch watching Ash Dryden's Programming Diversity Talk, which will be linked to in my references. Something I do want to mention, which Ash, which Ash cites in her talk, is that marginalising people based on group stereotypes is something we're all susceptible to doing. You might think that you're a logical, rational person and you would never treat someone differently because of one of these characteristics. Well, consider this. There was a study done on hiring for a job in academic science for a laboratory man manager position, and there were two applications that the people running the study used, and they were identical. The only difference was that they had a male or a female name. And the science faculty members who received these applications, who no doubt would think themselves logical, rational people, just like us, rated the male applicant as significantly more competent and hireable than the identical female applicant and they said they'd give the male a higher starting salary and more career mentoring. Interestingly, the gender of the faculty members who were doing these ratings did not affect the responses. Males and females rating these candidates were equally likely to exhibit bias against the female student. So bias can be really subtle, and we can have biases even against people from groups to, we, to which we ourselves belong. None of us are above this. So to home in on the lack of women now, how are we going with gender diversity in the IT community generally? Well, I have a few stats. So back in the mid-80s, about 37% of computer science undergrad degrees in the US were awarded to women, compared to just 18% in 2010. Again, in the late 80s, 42% of US software developers were women, whereas today it's around 20%. Uh, there was a 2013 survey around free and open source software, and it found that women make up about 11% of the open source community. And this is actually uh, a rise on what the previous survey found. The previous survey was more around 2 to 3%. Uh, there was some stats released by Google just the uh, last couple of weeks, and uh, they showed that globally, uh, in their, amongst their technical employees, there were just 17% women. And I might mention, too, that the racial statistics that they showed as well were actually even worse, uh, which were only for the US. But again, other big issues there, too. Not only do we have a problem with getting women into the industry, we have a problem with them leaving the industry. Uh, so one study found that 41% of technical women are gone after 10 years and 56% after 10 to 20, which is more than double the quit rate for men. And finally, I might mention there was a study that showed, uh, by surveying all the other research that is done, that there is no biological reason why women should perform worse than men at mathematical tasks. So you often hear this old chestnut. It's just simply not true. That's not the reason for these kind of stats. So that's women in IT generally. What about women in functional programming specifically? As far as I know, we have no official statistics on this, but anecdotally, it would seem that the percentage of women in FP is far worse than even the percentage of women in IT generally. One illustration of this from my own experience uh, was at the Yale Lambda Jam conference in Brisbane last year. I walked up to get my lanyard and my t-shirt and someone I'd never met before handed them to me without me saying a word. They could do that because out of 120 odd delegates, I was the only woman. Now that's a bit of a perk, I suppose, to be instantly recognised, uh, but it's one I'd gladly give up. And it was a bit heartening to see that at this year's event, the same event, I was not the only one, although there was still only a handful of us. And I might be all the way over in Australia, but I have reason to believe that it's not just me experiencing this. I've spoken with members of Lambda Ladies from many places in the world, and they too agree that the percentage of women in FP is far worse than in IT generally. So I have a few snippets of res their responses. So one says, yes, women are definitely underrepresented in FP uh, based, of their based on their observations in conferences at Euro in Europe and in the US. Another says that at a particular London FP language meetup group, they went and out of 100 attendees, they think they were the only woman there. And she says, I've never actually felt acutely out of place in an FP community until then. And finally, lest you think this is only other languages, uh, one person says, in the Erlang community, in which I know there is a vast underrepresentation under of women. So we're not as diverse as we should be as a community. Why do we care? I think we should care because we write programs for the whole population. 
and we should have a fair representation of that population creating them. The technology we produce has the power to shape our world and our future, and we want it to be shaped in a way that reflects the interests of all, not just an empowered few. This alone, I think, should be enough reason to care, uh, but if you don't find that convincing, consider this also. Studies have shown that having a more diverse workforce leads to more innovation, better performance in the marketplace, and increased profits. And there is a wealth of research to support this, but here are just a couple of findings. One study found that teams comprising women and men produce IT patents that are cited 26 to 42 percent more often than the norm for similar sorts of patents. And another study found that companies with diversity in leadership, and this is all types of diversity now, were more innovative and outperformed others. Employees at these companies were 45 percent more likely to report market share growth over the previous year and 70 percent more likely to report that the firm captured a new market. Why is this? People with different experiences have different perspectives. Sometimes it just takes one key insight to open up a whole new suite of potential applications. I saw an example of this just a couple of weeks ago. As a developer, I have this problem where I find it really hard to resist buying shiny new things with an API. And as such, last year I ended up buying a string of Aussie-designed intelligent Christmas lights called Holiday but I hadn't really found much use for them since Christmas time, so I decided to take them along to a weekend hack retreat a few weeks ago called CampJS. So what do you do with a string of programmable lights? And there they are there at camp. Well, before long, someone at camp had a key insight that opened up a new world of possibilities. They decided to arrange them as a grid. Before long, there was a camp app to do countdowns, one for scrolling text, an app that would display flags of the world based on Twitter hashtags, and even a snake game, which is what you can see there. I got in on the action too. I created a, a Node.js app on OpenShift to show the output for the game of life, which I've embedded here. So it enables people to do different seed patterns and then see the effects both here and up on what was the big screen, 7x7 seven seven res for the win. So this may not have been the most innovative idea ever, thinking inside the box, but it's something I hadn't thought of on my own. Having diversity of perspective makes these aha moments more likely to happen, and when they do, the whole group benefits. So why is our community not as big or diverse as we'd like it to be? Why do we have this problem? I decided to ask members of Lambda Ladies why they thought there was an issue, particularly with uh, regards to attracting women. They had a whole lot of different ideas, uh, but there were three kind of main threads to them. Firstly, FP has an image problem that turns people away. This was reiterated over and over in the responses I got, and here are a few snippets. They use words like deeply academic, vein of elitism, a sense of protectiveness, clubhouse style, and a culture of intellectual territoriality that's unfriendly to outsiders. Uh, someone else mentions the whole neck beard, beard thing, and says how unappealing that is, both to men and women. And finally, since FP tends to be sold in a hyper-intellectualized manner, this evokes the math is hard brand of anti-intellectualism. It has a differentially powerful impact on women due to the way we gender the sciences. That is, FP propaganda has a habit of taking the things which cause women to be underrepresented in STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, and math, generally, and then cranking them up to 11. So for anyone wondering what on earth these quotes could be referring to, let me give you a bit more of a concrete example. I'm sure many of you have seen this t-shirt before. By all means, it's a pretty funny slogan to an FP, uh, FP insider who understands it. But for outsiders, this kind of thing perpetuates the image of functional programming as inaccessible and academic. Let me be clear on this point. Promoting this kind of image to the wider community to keep FP exclusive by deliberately making the barriers to entry high, that doesn't make us super smart coding ninjas. That just makes us douchebags. <laughs> this is underscored by the second theme I saw running through the responses. That the functional programming community can at times be unwelcoming to newcomers. And here are again some snippets that reflect that. So one person says that the meetups they've been going to, the members tried to make the titles of the talks uh, inaccessible, and they actually kind of saw that as a barrier to entry that they wanted. Another says there were no women there. That was bizarre and made me feel very uncomfortable. I'd go to conferences and literally no one would talk to me unless I was very forward and grabbed people's attention. Someone else says there's simply always too much showing off and never enough treating people with respect. And finally, countless monad jokes were told. 
To be honest, I felt pretty convicted, conflicted after that evening. On the one hand, I really enjoyed the talks. On the other, I felt completely disassociated with the community itself. So finally, there was one more theme uh, that I noticed, which is it was a lack of support for beginners or learners. So one person just says this right out. They are not welcoming or encouraging to beginners. Despite what many of them say, they are the nerdiest of the nerds, and on some level, they want to keep it that way. Another person talks about the amount of privilege and luck it took them just to get to the point where they discovered functional programming. And then after that, adding on all the issues about maintaining involvement in the community. And another says most of the inroads seem to be academic and require a great deal of proactiveness, which takes confidence and, importantly, the privilege for someone to be willing to mentor you. Now, keep in mind, too, that these snippets come from women who are in the functional programming community. These are the ones who manage to overcome the, barrier, the barriers that they're talking about, at least for now. People leaving the community because they've had enough of this is another dimension of the problem. One respondent made the point, and it's an excellent one, that really the people we should be talking to about why they're not in the community are the people who aren't in the community. I suspect that their answers would reflect a lot of what we've seen here. So we have a problem. Our community is not as big or diverse as we would like. How can we solve it? I know sometimes you look at a kind of social problem like this and it just seems huge and unwieldy. It can feel like you don't even know where to start. As I said earlier, I can't offer definitive answers, but just as if we were writing some program, I think there is some value in considering our function signature, our inputs and outputs, before we look at a proposed method. So firstly, inputs. The inputs we're talking about in this case are people. In growing our community, we really need to reach out to a number of different groups. This includes those who haven't programmed before at all, and those who have but aren't actually doing FP. I think for FP particularly, the difference between the way we educate and reach out to people who have prior exposure to programming versus those who don't is quite stark. And community growth isn't all about quantity either. It's quality too. It's sometimes forgotten that the target of our effort should include members of our own community, present and past. We need to make sure we're both attracting new people and retaining the ones we have by making sure we're not burning them out and that they have the support they need. We may want to reach out to those who are no longer active to see if there's anything we can do to help them back into the fold. And of course, within these three broad groups, there are many subcategories we might want to think about using different approaches for, for example, children or people who are vision impaired. It's important that we consider who we're targeting with any outreach efforts and tailor what we do accordingly. We can't expect the same approach to work for everyone. So these inputs cover who we're targeting with our outreach, but what about the people doing the outreach work? Who is responsible for growing our community? This is sometimes overlooked, so I want you to hear this point loud and clear. You are. I am. All of us are. It is not the job of the minorities within a community to improve the diversity of the community. Putting the burden of this on them is unfair and only exacerbates the problem. If women, for example, are expected to be the only ones spending time going around and running special outreach events and doing other things to attract women, that is less time that they have to spend coding and actually improving their FP skills, which puts them at a disadvantage. It is everyone's job to help grow the community. Let's not burn out certain people with, with the responsibility. You don't get to say, it's not my problem. If you're a part of this community, then it's as much your problem as anyone else's. Next up, what outputs do we expect to see from what we do? What would it mean to be kicking goals in the community growth arena? I think this flows naturally from what I talked about earlier. We want to see a bigger community, so more people popping out at the end of that process as members of our community, and we want greater diversity in those members that we see. And we also want it to be, as we said, a functional community. We want, want those members to be happy people who haven't been lumped with all the responsibility and are actually able to focus on growing their knowledge of FP. That is going to help us reach our goals of making FP more mainstream, driving innovation, creating more jobs, and all that good stuff. So we've got our function signature down. What are we actually going to do to turn those inputs into the outputs? How can we break this problem down into smaller, more manageable pieces that can be composed to serve our end goal? This, of course, is the tough part. 
There are a lot of different ways we could tackle this. Uh, I just want to talk about three main themes connected to my own experience and the three reasons behind the problem that I talked about earlier. So when I go around talking about FP uh, and mention the lack of women, sometimes I get the question, well, how did you get into FP then? You know, what are you doing here? When I reflect on this, uh, there are kind of three main catalysts I can identify for why I am here today as a member of the FP community. I first became interested in FP in university thanks to one very passionate professor to whom I'll always be grateful. You see, at my university, the only course that covered different programming paradigms, such as logic and functional programming, had been removed from the curriculum by the time I came to study there. This professor, though, was so passionate about the need to educate students about these things that he offered to teach parts of the course to students in his own time in the library, in secret sessions. So I went along to these secret sessions in the library and learned about Haskell and Lisp and all these good things. And although I didn't really learn, I didn't really write a whole lot of code during these sessions, I was influenced by the professor's passion for this area and the many, many elegant functional solutions to problems that he showed us. He gave us an education in FP, but most importantly, it was an education that provided motivation, which is the first of the three themes I want to look at. It gave me a reason to want to learn more about FP in the future. And this story isn't unique to me. Actually, just last night, I was talking to another conference attendee who said the reason that they are in Erlang is because they had a professor that taught a course in their own time on Erlang. Um, so, you know, these kind of people are around and that passion, it's really quite powerful, I think. So after I'd finished university and entered the workforce, I decided to go along to the local functional group. I was sufficiently interested. And I have to say, the first time there was pretty uncomfortable. When I walked in, I felt like people were looking at me as if I'd wandered into the wrong room. I felt very intimidated uh, when the speaker asked questions like, put your hand up if you know what a closure is, which was still a bit of a fuzzy concept for me at the time. The dilemma was putting my hand up would be uh, a confirmation to those around me that I didn't, oh, sorry, not putting my hand up would be a confirmation that I didn't belong in that room, but putting it up meant I might be called along upon to explain the concept, which was quite terrifying. I probably only understood about 10% of the talk that I saw, although luckily in that 10% there was a discussion of the maybe data type and some of my colleagues at work had just introduced an optional data type in our Java, so I actually saw something that was immediately useful, uh, which did help to motivate me to return. Ultimately though, if the only exposure I had uh, to functional programming was at that meetup group, I'm not sure I would still be here and still be part of this community today because it wasn't a safe, friendly place to learn for me. The breakthrough for me came when I was invited to join a small study group that was going through the Learn Your Haskell book, uh, just meeting once a week. It was, I was undoubtedly the least experienced programmer in the group, but it didn't matter. We were all new to Haskell and everyone's ideas were valued there. We all took turns leading the group. Um, there, was no, there was no expert. We were a group of equals. So we worked our way through the entire book together over the course of about six months and it was exactly what I needed to get up to speed. It was a safe space for me to learn. And that's the second theme I want to talk about, safe spaces. So by the end of the study group, I had a reasonable handle on FP and Haskell basics, but I also knew there was a huge amount I still had to learn. So for that, I kept attending the local functional group. And there, I found two people who really helped me along, my, along the way. The first of those is someone whose name you might know because he's been part of the Erlang community and that's OJ Reeves. OJ's contribution to my journey is just that he was always friendly and encouraging. While others wouldn't say anything to me when I was new to the group, OJ always made an effort to come up and say hello and introduce me to other people. It's a very simple thing, but it made a huge difference. It's also just always encouraging. Uh, when I felt overwhelmed by how much I had to learn, he always seemed to be there uh, to give me the boost that I needed. Another person that's been significant for me is Tony Morris, who again is someone you may have heard of. I refer to Tony as Brisbane's functional programming guru. He really knows his stuff, and importantly, his door is always open. I knew I could always go and ask him to look over my code or explain what something meant, and he would make himself available to do it. And this has been really important for me in my growth as a functional programmer. And it's also given me the reassurance I needed to start to step out and do some presentations uh, to help other people come more up to speed with FP. I knew that if I showed Tony my material first, he would pull me up on anything that wasn't quite right, which gave me the confidence to be able to go out there, even though I'm certainly no expert. 
So OJ and Tony have both been important figures on my journey because they have served as mentors. And that's the third theme I want to talk about, mentoring. So that's my story, and based on that, I want to talk about those three areas that I think we can work on to grow our functional programming community. Education, providing motivation, creating safe spaces, and mentoring. I think all of these are important if we want people who are currently outsiders to become productive, happy members of the community. So firstly, let's have a look at the details of how we can implement a solution for education providing motivation. This part of the solution I think we can use to help counter the FP image problem I mentioned earlier, cutting through all those misconceptions about our craft being academic and elite and whatnot. So let's consider the inputs to this method. There are a few. Firstly, we want to educate beginners, and this means we need to create beginner-friendly content. This is easier said than done. I said at the start of my talk that it's, it's easy to forget the struggles you face as an FP insider once you're on the other side of that. I think it's also really easy to forget all the little things that you had to learn along the way. And the way this manifests is that when you then come to teach someone else, you often skip steps uh, that seem just so obvious to you now. So one classic example I have of that is when I was teaching a workshop um, to teenage girls, teaching them how to use the terminal. I thought I'd explained it uh, adequately, but as I went around the room, I saw some girls and they were, they were there scrolling up in their terminal history trying to change things. And I realised in that moment that, you know, I'd obviously skipped over something quite core to how one uses a terminal, uses a terminal because it just seemed so obvious and natural to me. But of course, it wasn't obvious or natural to them. And we have to be very mindful of this kind of thing when we're trying to educate beginners. A second group we want to reach out and educate about people in FP is those in underrepresented groups. But how do we do that? In my experience, the answer to this is pretty simple. You invite them. You ask them. There's a functional programming course uh, run by a company in Australia called NICTA, and they ran it in Brisbane earlier this year, and not a single woman applied to attend or came along. The organisers weren't very happy with that, so they reached out to me, and we decided to run the course again in Brisbane, but this time we called it the Lambda Ladies NICTA course, and we specifically invited women to come along, even though we also still allowed men to apply. The result was that the participants in the course ended up being about 60% women. It was exactly the same course material as, as has been run before. The difference in the demographic was just due to the way we advertised it. We, just, we promoted it in all the different women's in tech groups that we had locally, and also that we had a woman on board to help teach it, myself. And we found the women who attended did equally as well as the men. Here's one comment from one of the women uh, that I found really encouraging. She says, I think a lot of people are scared of functional programming. It's definitely a barrier but I think it was helpful that women were specifically invited to this. And she says, I feel like I have a decent grasp on monads now. I'm wondering what all the fuss is about, which is always nice to see. The last input I want to mention is people from other programming language communities. And I think we should definitely reach out to people from other programming language communities, but I also think we can learn a lot from them and their approaches to education. Rails Girls and Rails Bridge, for example, are two fantastic efforts to attract more people to Rails that we can learn from, I think. Rails Girls does a really good job of very quickly getting people up to speed and giving them that motivation to keep learning. So we run Rails Girls weekends in Brisbane twice now, uh, and I took part of those because I believe it's part of my job to support all efforts to uh, increase diversity. And the events, I think, were a resounding success. We've already seen people who attended just those short weekend events now going on to actually get jobs uh, as Ruby developers. So some in the functional community have already started to copy this approach. We now have some events such as Closure Bridge, uh, which we ran for the first time in Brisbane just a few weeks ago. These sort of events, I think, really need our support. But I also think there's plenty of room for more of them. I think we can also learn from the really friendly, welcoming nature of a lot of other programming language communities. I've experienced this in many communities, including Ruby, Python, and JavaScript. So at CampJS, when I wrote that Node app for the game of life, I struggled a bit because I don't do a lot of Node and JavaScript sometimes surprises me with its return types and its non-functional way of, of doing some things. But someone else from the camp sat down with me and they went through every line of code I wrote with me and helped to explain some of the Node idioms, um, which I think was really helpful and it's just quite typical of that community and the attitude they have. It's very valuable when you're a newcomer to have that. And I think this is something we should be known for too as a community. Taking part in that Camp JS event was also a really worthwhile experience just to actually genuinely 
have a go and try to experience what these people, the JavaScript people, are going through. So I have a first-hand knowledge of that when you then come to try and talk about functional things. I think sometimes we just come in and start criticising uh, the way that other language communities do things without first actually really trying to understand the frustrations that they have and how things really work for them. So I think it's quite useful to go through that experience. So what are the outputs we want from our educational outreach? I think there are two key things. We want learning to take place. We want to be able to set some learning goals and make sure participants, rather than leaving frustrated and confused, actually get there and reach them. And secondly, as I've already talked about, we want our education to provide the necessary motivation for people to keep learning. We're never going to be able to teach people everything about FP in a talk or workshop, whether it's one hour or a day or a whole week even. We, but we can make sure that we leave them with a hunger to want to learn more and to continue the journey. So how do we actually go about this? Well, from my experience teaching a few workshops and, uh, on functional programming and other topics um, and some of the reading I've done, I'd like to offer a few suggestions. I think we need to really carefully consider our curricula and our pedagogy. That's what we teach and how we teach it. And some general tips I would offer around that uh, is that we always need to consider our audience and build on what they already know. To do this, you need to assess what they already know first, rather than just charging in and inundating them with information. And then set a series of small attainable goals leading up to your overall learning goal, so that your students are buoyed by some success along the way. I think one often forgotten aspect of how we teach is to use visual mediums. Uh, there's certainly a lack of that in a lot of the material we see, but it really helps to solidify knowledge. And also, as I was always taught as a journalist, we need to keep our language simple. Words matter in teaching. Unexplained jargon can be really intimidating. Use our unambiguous, simple language and explain every acronym or unfamiliar term. Break it down. Basically, do the exact opposite of what I did in my demo at the start. Secondly, language choice. This is a pretty controversial subject. I just want to look at a few points based on my reading. What makes a good teaching language can be very different from what makes a good programming language generally. And there is some evidence that the best language to use may actually depend on the cognitive characteristics of your students. So there may not be just one language that is always the best one to use for teaching. And there's also some evidence that syntax may matter. There's a really interesting study that's linked to in my references. Uh, you can read about that. It didn't actually include a functional language, but they found that students taught Java or Perl uh, performed on par with those taught language with randomly generated keywords, whereas students taught Ruby or Python did better, which is it's interesting. I think those using the Erlang VM have a really great teaching option with Elixir, the gateway drug into the functional world, as Dave Thomas has used it. I'd love to see how successful efforts can be uh, using that to teach functional programming going forward. Next, I want to mention tooling. This can be a real headache for beginners and is often overlooked. Most professional programming tools are not designed with beginners in mind. We have to make a concerted effort to explain environment setup and tooling to novices so they're not stuck with error messages that they have no idea how to address. I think cloud computing can be really useful here. We may be able to abstract away some of the environment headache uh, by hosting educational material in the cloud. And I've tried this by using uh, the OpenShift PaaS for some of my workshops and have found it to work really well, especially with complete beginners to programming. I think education can happen in many contexts, but we've seen great success when we make the effort to organise focused events, like Rails Girls, Closure Bridge, and the NICTA workshop I mentioned earlier. Our local functional programming group has been running some hack nights where they're just experienced functional programmers available to help get beginners up to speed and help set up their environments and all of that, which has been really useful. I think we really need to consider our onboarding processes from the point of view of a beginner, as was pointed out by Dave Thomas and Jose Valim in their Erlang Factory keynote. So when the workshop is over, people still need a path to follow to get themselves set up and delve into development. And I think we can definitely do a better job of this, make sure there's plenty of good beginner-friendly content available to walk people around some of the potential stumbling blocks. And finally, it's my opinion that we will do a better uh, job of attracting people to FP if we take a positive approach, you catch more flies with honey than you do vinegar, as they say. After one of my recent talks on FP in another language community, one of the attendees tweeted they were interested in learning more, and they said the following. Not starting with all your languages suck was pretty compelling. I think that sums it up nicely. 
Let's tell others what FP has to offer rather than just going around telling them they're doing it wrong. So that's a brief look at some of the details of a possible approach to education. Obviously, there's a lot more that could be said about this area, but hopefully that's just provided a little bit of food for thought. Next, I want to talk about creating safe spaces. This approach, I think, helps to address the problem of the community sometimes being unwelcoming. This is really important for functional programming because functional programming is such a different way of looking at problems and even experienced pro uh, programmers have to go through this period of adjustment when they feel like complete beginners again. It's hard for everyone, but it's particularly hard if you're from a group that happens to be a minority in the community when you're already battling all the things that go along with that. So I think this is one of the big reasons for having a group like Lambda Ladies. Actually, when I first had the crazy idea to start a group called Lambda Ladies, I'd not actually met any other women in FP, and I dismissed the thought because I was worried it would be a group of one and there would be no point. I turned out to be very, very wrong. Uh, about a year after I first thought about that, I decided it would be cool to submit something on functional programming to the Grace Hopper Celebration, which is a large women's tech conference. And I put the word out on Twitter for some other women in FP to collaborate with. There ended up being five of us, and that was four more women in FP than I'd ever dealt with before. So we submitted to the conference, and ultimately our proposal was rejected. However, the process of working on the proposal together was a really positive one for all of us. We never met in person, but we developed a bond around these shared experiences we found we had as women in FP, and often the only women in our local functional programming groups. So out of this camaraderie, Lambda Ladies was born. And far from being a group of one or a group of five, it has grown to be a group of more than 200 members. It's mostly an online group with most interaction taking place on Google Groups, but there have been several real-life meetups. These often happen around conferences. The five of us who formed the group had already found our way into the FP community despite the hurdles, but we were able to create a safe space for those who possibly weren't there yet. And the responses from my Lambda Ladies survey are going to spell out the role of having such a group. So one person says, it's a space where you don't always have to be on your guard against harassment, where you don't have to worry about how you present yourself, that femininity, femininity will undermine your credibility, or that asking stupid questions will affect the way people think of women as a whole. Just seeing other women as energising, one says, and I certainly agree with that. Another makes the point that it's important to understand that women create their own spaces to create tech because all the existing spaces are for men by default. Another says it makes them le feel less isolated. And finally, on the point of whether or not this is about segregation, which it certainly is not, one says women's groups ultimately are not insular. They exist to strengthen members' resolve so that women can both achieve individual success and bring progress to the program community as a whole. And that's certainly true. This is not about separating it and having all the women over here and everyone else over there. It's about giving women or any other group a safe space to be so that they can then come out and bring that success to the community as a whole. So what are the inputs to this? Well, I think it's just those who may not otherwise participate, but also all of us, because rather than having these safe spaces off to the side, perhaps we can make the community as a whole a safer space for everyone, and it takes all of us uh, to achieve that. Here's a quote from Tim Chevalier on this point. He says, Men seem to feel powerless to do anything about the state of affairs, and yet they have power. They can let men who make these comments know that sexism isn't okay, and he says countering it requires courage and moral stamina. It's work that largely needs to be done by men. So again, it's the role of everyone to make this community better for us as a whole, and it's the article linked to there is a great one if you haven't read it before. What's the output of this? We just want people who are comfortable to be able to focus on FP itself rather than all this other extraneous stuff that we just really is, is just getting in the way. How do we do this? Well, there's a few things that are useful. Uh, one is codes of conduct. And we saw this actually at Lambda Ladies. There was a woman who was looking to learn a particular functional language. I won't say which one. And she found a mentor online, it was a guy, and he introduced her to a particular IRC channel for that. And there she was exposed to some really negative things. Uh, there was sexist and homophobic language, and she was not very comfortable in this space. Um, so she came to Lambda Ladies, and you know, she talked about this, and what should she do? She didn't want to lose the mentor, but she was really feeling uncomfortable with this. In the end, she didn't have to do anything, because the mentor realised what was going on was inappropriate, talked to the people in the channel, called them up on it, 
and created a code of conduct for it. So we saw a really good outcome there uh, from people just being willing to stand up and call this stuff out when they see it, and then uh, providing a way, a path for these things to be addressed in future when there is inappropriate behaviour. I think using inclusive language is really important. If you read that full uh, blog post from Tim Chevalier, you'll see it's actually sparked by a single line that someone said in the Haskell community that instantly made everyone in that room who was a woman uh, feel like they were the other, they're out of place. And that is just, it's so easy to do. It can just be you know, a couple of words and you've done that. Uh, so it's something to be really mindful for. The words we speak do have great power. And finally, uh, there are a few suggestions from the Haskell Symposium where they talked a little bit about this issue last year and the way that uh, people have been harmed in that community. The suggestions were, yes, speaking up, calling the stuff out, listening to one another and the effect of the things that are going on, supporting one another and taking care of ourselves, so not letting people burn out pursuing this stuff. So the last thing I want to talk about uh, in terms of the three themes is how we might address the problem of lack of support for people who are learning, and I think that's through mentoring. Education isn't enough in isolation. Uh, I went to a conference in New Zealand recently where Tony Morris did a talk about monads and other principled things, and afterwards I heard, overheard someone saying, well, I still don't know what a monad is. And this can be a bit frustrating, because you think, well, you just had it laid out like really clearly, there were no analogies or whatnot. But I think what they actually meant was, I still don't know how I would sit down and apply this concept for myself. And it's difficult to give people that in a talk or even a workshop. They need to build up their intuition on their own. But in doing that, you want to make sure they're going down the right path. And as they do, they're going to have questions. And I think this is where mentoring comes in, helping to give some direction to the learning and encouragement and stepping in to provide assistance as necessary. So who can do this mentoring? Well, anyone who's one step ahead of the person that's being mentored. Uh, recently, Ed Komet, who's like a prolific Haskeller, came to Brisbane and everyone was kind of in awe in him. He was this oracle, just everyone would come up and ask a question and be writing, scribbling down formulas on the back of an envelope kind of thing. And we we're all so impressed by his formidable knowledge. And then a week later, I found myself at Camp JS and people were coming up to me and they were asking about currying and monads and I found myself scribbling on the back of an envelope and writing formulas and things. And I had this moment where I thought, wow, to these people in this context, I am like the Ed Komet. <laughs> Even though I am no expert, you know, I don't have all that knowledge, but you only need to be just that one little bit, that one step ahead and you can fall into that role of being the mentor. What's the output of this? Mentors become, mentees become mentors. This is growing our community uh, and just continuing that cycle. How do we mentor? I think it's pretty simple. It's about being friendly and encouraging and really listening to what people are saying and just sharing your knowledge in that context. So there are three areas I wanted to talk about, but there are also some other suggestions uh, from the Lambda lady, so I'll quickly show you a few more things that they said. Uh, one said just getting rid of all the, the FP propaganda and treating FP like any other paradigm, something quite easy that we could tackle. Another talks about the lack of mentors, saying we should get more women featured on uh, number file, Haskell cast and whatnot. Outreach, training, scholarships for conferences. Also education, not about FP, but educating everyone about the ways that tech culture enforces power dynamics that disadvantage uh, these groups that we've been talking about and reaching out to organisations that focus on improving the experiences of these people. We're not experts necessarily on, on diversity and codes of conduct and all these kinds of things, but there are organisations that are, and they're there and willing to help. And finally, if we can get a more open discussion of the phenomenon, we can change it. I think that's really key, just having the conversation. So the last area I wanted to talk about briefly is just testing. I've mentioned along the way uh, that a lot of these things, you know, they're a little bit of guesswork. Don't really know what the numbers are for the FP community. So why not actually do something about that? We could do some kind of FP community survey to give us a benchmark so we can actually then measure the result of our efforts. I think we could probably do some work to assess the teaching tools that we're using and how they affect beginners. It may be that we need to develop some new tools. Uh, we're not going to know that unless we take an imperial cool approach to this. And finally, I think we really need to be open to feedback from outside the community. It's hard to do, but if we can find out why people from particular groups are saying that they're not in our community and they haven't felt welcome, 
and we can listen to their stories, um, that's really going to inform our efforts going forward. So let's recap. I said that the FP community has a problem and that it's not as big or diverse as it could or should be. The percentage of women, for example, appears to be much worse than in the programming community generally. There are a number of reasons this might be. I suggested that FP's negative image, a community that can sometimes be unwelcoming, and lack of support for learners can all play a part. We considered how we might solve this problem, looking at who we should reach out to and who is responsible for doing that outreach, and that was all of us. We looked at the outputs we'd like to see, or the goal of the community being bigger and more diverse, without burning out individuals or failing to support the existing members of the community. We looked at some possible methods for doing that, education that provides motivation, the creation of safe spaces and mentoring. And finally, we had a brief chat about how we might be able to test the effectiveness of our efforts. At the start of this talk, I showed you some code written in T-Line to help you remember what it was like when you were an FP outsider. The code was part of an implementation of the game of life. I wrote at CampJS to be displayed on a string of intelligent lights arranged in a grid, thanks to the input from others at the camp. May not have been the greatest innovation ever to think inside the square, but it's a reminder that we need those light bulb moments to drive innovation, and that having a diverse array of voices in, our in the conversation helps to promote that. I'd like to conclude by revisiting that app. In the game of life, little communities of live cells form, but they also die off when there are too many, as if by overpopulation. New cells can be spawned, but only when they have exactly three live neighbours. What if we changed the rules of the game? What if no cell died off due to overpopulation and any cell in contact with at least three live ones came to life? Or in other words, what if we were able to retain all the switched on people in a community and all clusters of members were able to attract new people? Well, we get growth, life, and eventually world domination. <laughs> If we can attract more people reflecting greater diversity, educate people, create safe spaces, and mentor them, then the result of that is going to be a bigger, better community, and that benefits all of us. All of us are responsible for sharing the Lambda love in a positive, effective way to help build this bigger, more diverse, functional programming community. If you're interested in some of the references that I've mentioned and resources, you'll find them all here on my slides. And you can find these slides at community.codemiller.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter, on Codemiller, and I just encourage you to keep the conversation going. Thank you.